Welcome. Please remain standing for the playing of our national anthem by the Western Brass Quintet.
Thank you. You may be seated. I am Dr. Peter Zimkowski, Associate Dean for Student Affairs. It's my privilege to be your host. On behalf of Dean Hal Jensen, the Medical School Board of Directors, Associate Deans, Assistant Deans, Department Chairs, and the faculty, it's my honor to welcome you all and to thank you for joining us today for the first commencement of Western Michigan University Homer Stryker MD School of Medicine. As the Associate Dean for Student Affairs, I've had the pleasure of working alongside these graduates both in the classroom and in the clinic. I'm impressed with not only the physicians you have become in the last four years, but also the people you are today. Congratulations. I'd also like to take the opportunity to thank the guests who are with us today. Thank you for supporting these students today and every day. And of course, a special thank you to all the mothers in the crowd who are sharing their Mother's Day with the graduates. I would like to introduce the founding dean of Western Michigan University Homer Stryker MD School of Medicine, Dr. Hal B. Jensen. Thank you, Pete. Good afternoon and welcome to the families, friends, and faculty who are here with us today to recognize the success of our inaugural class of graduates. Joining me on the stage today are the commencement speakers, medical school deans and department chairs, and seven current members of our current board of directors, including the chair of the board, Dr. Edward Montgomery, the new president of Western Michigan University, and also three former members of our board. Thank you all for joining with us today to, to join us in this celebration. On my first day as founding dean for this medical school on March 22nd, 2011, I attended a very special community event that was dubbed Operation Historic Moment. That day, Western Michigan University President John Dunn announced the $100 million, $100 million foundational gift to start this medical school in Kalamazoo, which I would serve as founding dean. That was a momentous day, indeed, for me personally, for the medical school, for the university, for our two hospital affiliates, Bronson and Borges and also for the entire community. Fast forward now more than seven years. The inaugural class of 2018 is set to graduate. Today is a momentous day for all of you, the graduates, your family, and your friends, but it's indeed also a momentous day for Western Michigan University Homer Stryker MD School of Medicine, because this inaugural commencement marks the end of our first as a medical school and that we are no longer a new medical school. Our medical school mission is to educate and inspire the exceptional clinicians, leaders, educators, advocates, and researchers of tomorrow. We fulfill our mission through the careers and good work of our graduates. I offer three perspectives of congratulations to our graduates. First, I offer my congratulations to the graduates on their successful completion of a very rigorous curriculum that led to the MD degree. Our faculty have developed this curriculum to position you to be successful through the rest of your careers. Even though you are graduating today from, from Western Michigan University Homer Stryker MD School of Medicine, you will always, and many of you are leaving Kalamazoo, you will always be part of the medical school family. And you're always welcome home. Second, congratulations on choosing this medical school for your medical education. As you accepted our offer of admission, you expressed confidence in us as a new medical school as we showed confidence in you as a new medical student to journey together to be able to, to be successful for you as well as for us. When we met during your interview days, I told you that we expected and in fact required your feedback and your input. You gave that to us. We listened and we used that to make the medical school even better. 
I also ask you to bring to your medical school education a pioneering spirit. As a new medical school, we wanted to incorporate your pioneering spirit with ours. And you have done that. And I ask you to take that with you wherever you go, that wherever you are, wherever you may be, that you will make a difference in the communities where you are. Thank you for successfully graduating. Because as I've told the faculty, our success as a medical school, their success as faculty, is really measured by the success of our graduates. So I'm glad you made it through the curriculum. I also want to offer congratulations to you on your choice to enter the medical profession. Among the many endeavors that you could have selected for your, your career, Congratulations on making a choice that will have a profound impact on the individuals that will be your patients and on the communities that you serve. As a physician, your patients will share their most private thoughts, their most troubling challenges. They place a unique trust in you as a physician. When you're the physician in the room taking care of a patient, you may only be one person in the world. But to that patient in the room at that moment, you are all the world to that patient. As the inaugural class, you have set the precedent for future classes. You are an exceptional class. The bar is high. As this class and future classes graduate and go forth to serve, you fulfill the mission of this medical school by being exceptional. I thank you for allowing us to be part of your lives, to permit us to educate and to inspire you. Congratulations, and I welcome you to the medical profession. Thank you, Dean Jensen. Now I'd like to welcome Jacqueline Dauk. She's a graduate selected by her peers to speak today on behalf of the class of 2018. Jackie earned her undergraduate degree from the University of Michigan. She'll be completing her residency training in general surgery at the University of Arizona College of Medicine in Tucson, Arizona. She is graduating with com commendation in research, was awarded the Researcher Clear Award by her peers, is a member of the Upjohn Humanism Honor Society. Good afternoon to the deans, members of faculty and the administration, family, friends, and finally, my fellow graduates. I am incredibly honored and humbled to be standing up here representing the inaugural class of Western Michigan University, Homer Stryker MD School of Medicine. Before I start, I want to honor the mothers and grandmothers who are here with us today. Your love and support have never been un gone unnoticed the last four years. Thank you, and happy Mother's Day. Our class has had the distinct and unique privilege of playing the role of trailblazers, helping pave the way for future student doctors here at WMed. In our first years, we founded interest groups and journal clubs, established active citizenship projects, competed on multiple sports teams, and held significant roles in religious groups throughout the Kalamazoo community. As medical first responders, we've worked alongside EMTs and firefighters, volunteered at local events, including festivals and football tailgates, and for some, found ourselves activating the emergency response system during daily life in the real world. Our class has proudly represented WMED at the, both the national and international levels attending 38 conferences since 2014 and giving over 130 oral and poster presentations. Together, our CVs boast over 100 written abstracts and 69 published journal articles. With board scores well above the national average and a 100% match rate, we have truly established ourselves and created a reputation of success. For our for our class, these accomplishments did not stop short of WMED, but also followed us into daily life. Since school started, eight classmates have gotten married, four are now engaged, we've watched delightfully as the Bruger and Von Brock families have grown, and many of us have 
uh, welcomed new in-laws, nieces, and nephews along the way. Um, we've also had classmates that took time off to conduct research, representing WMED internationally as well in Peru, Uganda, Madagascar, Thailand, India, and South Africa, just to name a few. We've also exper experienced many firsts. The first time non-Michiganders witnessed the beauty of the Great Lakes, and for some, the first time learning how to live in snow. But more importantly, the first patients we interviewed on our own, unsupervised. The first time we sutured, intubated a patient, and performed CPR, as well as the first time we were trusted with a scalpel or delivered a baby. Threaded throughout these triumphs, we've also met many challenges along the way. As pioneers, we trialed iBooks and lecture PowerPoints. We've also worked alongside professors and faculty to gain full accreditation from the LCME. Clinical years confronted many of us with elusive etiologies of disease, often requiring difficult conversations with our patients and their families, and at times ending with some passing away. Over the past four years, many of us have had to cope as family members of our own have passed away. We've lost five parents, two moms and three dads. We've lost professor, professors within the WMED community, a dear friend and cheerleader of our program, Polly Jensen, and one of our own classmates, Kevin Vokes. Certainly, some days have left us a little bit more bruised than others, but we always came together and su to support one another and in the process formed and strengthened relationships that will last a lifetime. Last fall, I picked up an audio book on the art of asking questions. I found the subject intriguing as interview season was well underway and I always found myself scrounging for something original to ask when, when they said, do you have any more questions? I listened to this audio book on my way to an interview absorbing the lessons behind each question and finding ways to relate them to a career in medicine. The author, James Ryan, a dean of education at Harvard University, claimed that if you get in the habit of asking yourself five essential questions in life, you can create understanding, spark curiosity, initiate progress, fortify relationships, and draw attention to the important things in life. Today, I want to share with you these five questions. The first, Wait, what? Is an idiom of which, thanks to Generation Z, has come to express confused surprise. Being a medical student easily lends itself to this expression. Take, for example, microbiology. <laughs> Who knew there was danger in having a kitten for a pet, walking barefoot on the beach, or eating at a picnic? I'd venture to guess many of you in the crowd are asking yourself this very question. Wait, what? How can a kitten be dangerous? <laughs> Clinical years furthered our use of this phrase. My very first day of clerkships, for instance, I was tasked with waking a patient at 5 o'clock in the morning and performing a physical exam for the first time on my own. Wait, you're asking me to do what? In the OR, we found ourselves many a times in place in the most precarious of positions, instructed to retract gently, but also at the same time forcefully. <laughs> Gently, but also forcefully. Wait, what? <laughs> or one of my personal favorites, when Peter White was handed a scalpel and asked to perform a stab incision. <laughs> You'll have to ask him how that story ends. <laughs> In medicine, snap decisions are inevitably common practice. By, but by asking ourselves, wait, what, we can take a moment to step back and make sure we understand, guaranteeing comprehension of the tasks at hand, clarifying any limitations, and doing so prior to forming final conclusions. I suggest you use this question as a fail-safe in your future practice. It will give you time to think before you act. The second question is, I wonder why, or I wonder if. Such rumination revolves around curiosity, highlighting areas that have room for improvement. Medicine works on a frontier between knowledge and ignorance. Ignorance of medicine, that which remains unfamiliar or unanswered, is the larger portion, knowledge the smaller. 
We should not be afraid to admit this, what we do not know. There's no shame in it. As physicians, we must acknowledge these mysteries, but never settle for them. I encourage you all to embrace your role as lifelong learners by asking, I wonder if, or I wonder why. Use these questions to seek out answers, but also use them to confront common practice. We must avoid the dangers of complacency and overconfidence in the accepted theories of today. Instead, continue to challenge them. By asking, I wonder if, or I wonder why, we can strengthen what is already known and potentially discover something new along the way. The third question, couldn't we just, or couldn't we at least, allows for progress, a way to improve, and even a way to get started. The clinical years of medical school introduce us firsthand to the physician's position on the medical team. As novice students, we began by adopting the role of good listeners, relying on the guidance of our residents and attendings. With each new clerkship, our experiences allowed us to gain confidence, taught us how to navigate the system, and steadily granted us autonomy. We've learned that the practice of medicine is a well-oiled machine, and yet, as with all fields of vocation, we have come to understand that there is always room for improvement. Couldn't we just, or couldn't we at least? I challenge you all to use these questions to expose the limitations of common practice, highlighting them, learning from them, and having the courage to pose a solution. The fourth of five questions, how can I help, is based off one of the most humane instincts there is, the instinct to lend a hand. I read an article recently about a diehard Green Bay Packers fan. This man had not missed a home game for over 15 years. Just like every other stubborn, superstitious fan, he insisted on taking the same airline, sitting in the same stadium seat, and wearing the same sweatshirt to every game. In the, in the story, the man had just boarded an airplane on his way to a game when he had realized that his lucky sweatshirt was left back at the security checkpoint. After explaining the situation to the flight attendant, he reluctantly sat back down in his chair and likely contemplated the inevitable demise of the Packers season. <laughs> the story goes on to explain that the sweatshirt was actually recovered and returned back to the passenger before the airplane backed out and took off. Guess who went to retrieve it? The pilot. The point is, you will never be too important to lend a hand. How can I help? Ask this with humility. Ask your patients, ask their families, ask the nurses, the physical therapists, the social workers. Ask the front desk clerk, the janitor, the lady in line in front of you at the grocery store. Ask your spouse, your brother, your sister, your kids. You will never regret coming to the aid of others and being nice to people along the way. I also urge you all to ask, how can I help myself? Too often in medicine, we hear of colleagues that, whose minds have fallen victim to doubt, regret, and defeat. We must remember we, that we live most of our lives inside of our own heads. What we dwell on inevitably and profoundly shapes who we are. Make sure it's a nice place to be. And if you ever find yourself needing someone to lean, a hand, lean, lean on, never forget, we will always be in this together. The fifth and final question, what truly matters? In the context of medicine, the answer will always be the patient. The patient is what truly matters, not the disease process or the correct medication, not the surgery needed or the therapy after. Daily life for us may revolve around hospitals and clinics, but for our parent, patients, it does not. Never forget how privileged you are to gain their trust and sit within their inner circle. What truly matters? Ask your patients, learn their stories, find out what truly matters to them, and strive to accommodate their future they have in mind. The five essential questions. Wait, what? I wonder why. Couldn't we at least? How can I help? What truly matters? Use the answers to guide your steps as clinicians, leaders, educators, advocates, and researchers. Yesterday we were students, today we are doctors, and tomorrow we become interns. <laughs> as you embark on the first year residency, don't forget you are who you run with. Seek out the Dr. Lurkies of the world. 
As Fails says, it's not practice makes perfect, perfect practice makes perfect. Make sure to take pride in the way you finish. And always remember, slow and steady wins the race. Medicine is hard, it will make you doubt your knowledge, question your decision-making skills, and at times leave you after long shifts bewildered with lost battles. Just put one foot in front of the other, and if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. On the first day of medical school, we learned that being a good doctor is predicated on being a good human being. WMed has taught us to elevate this standard, wear it well, the kindness, the genuine compassion that this community, community has taught us. Never diminish who you are and what you are being and doing. Be transparent with your patients, protect your integrity by always putting your best foot forward, and take ownership in your efforts. Medicine requires us to get beyond what we are and face the things that are so much greater than ourselves. Ask for help when you need it. Our path to the MD degree was steep and grueling, lengthy at times, but it was our character, commitment, and discipline that enabled us to follow through. I'm very proud to be a member of the inaugural class of 2018, surrounded by 47 brilliant and inspiring brand new physicians. You only pass by once, but what you leave behind is what you stood for. Our time at here has come to an end, but together the class of 2018 has left a lasting mark. Congratulations. Thank you, Jackie. It's my pleasure to introduce today's commencement speaker. In September 2014, he came to WMED to make the keynote address to the class of 2018 at their white coat ceremony. This is an annual tradition in which first year students receive their first short white coat of their medical school career. The white coat, a symbol of the medical profession for more than 100 years, signifies the student's commitment to the practice of medicine and the patient-physician relationship. We welcome Dr. Alan Shapiro back today to speak again to the class of 2018 as they graduate. Dr. Alan Shapiro is Assistant Clinical Professor in Pediatrics at Albert Einstein College of Medicine and Senior Medical Director for Community Pediatric Programs located in New York's City South Bronx. Community Pediatric Programs is a collaboration between the Children's Hospital at Montefiore and the Children's Health Fund. Its programs include a mobile-based homeless health care program serving children, families, and the street youth in New York City's shelter system since 1987, a federally qualified community health center in the South Bronx serving the poorest congressional district in the nation since 1993, for which he was its first medical director, and a mobile-based dental clinic since 2011. He is also the director of the Center for Preventative Health and Special Initiatives dedicated to closing gaps in health disparities throughout, through the development of innovative best practice models of care in community-based settings. The center has had a number of recent publications in peer-reviewed journals and is presented widely in national conferences. Dr. Shapiro is a pediatrician dedicated to providing care to vulnerable children throughout his career. He has extensive experience working with underserved and marginalized pediatric populations such as homeless, street-involved youth, urban inner city, and immigrant children. Additionally, Dr. Shapiro has had a major role in disaster relief efforts over the past 20 years, leading medical teams in the aftermath of Hurricanes Andrew, Katrina, and Sandy, as well as in New York City on 9-11. Dr. Shapiro has worked internationally on medical missions, serving as a team pediatrician in Ecuador and Peru. In 2012, Dr. Shapiro was a recipient of the Children's Health Fund Founders Award, with which he co-founded Terra Firma, a health and justice program for immigrant children. This medical legal partnership clinic has been receiving national attention for its multidisciplinary model of care, providing medical, psychosocial, and legal services to the newly arrived, unaccompanied immigrant children from Central America. Dr. Alan Shapiro.
Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for inviting me back to West Med, which is a lot easier to, to say than Homer Stryker, <laughs> MD, School of Medicine, which I heard is now a song. Um, it is really an honor to be here. And when, when Peter Z, Dr. Z asked to speak, my first question was, wait, what? <laughs> so I really appreciated those questions. Um, I'm not sure if you all remember, but four years ago, my friend and colleague, Dr. Cheryl Dixon, invited me here to give the White Coat Humanism in Medicine Address. And now I've been asked to come back for your commencement address. How cool is that? I'm only sorry that I haven't been able to be here and visit you guys in the last four years, but as you know, time flies. So much has happened in these past four years. The Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, and almost 18 million insured patients since I was last here. That's a lot of access to health care. And now a new administration, and well, we still have Obamacare. That's good. Since you've been in school, there have been Ebola epidemics and Zika epidemics, and other public health threats loom, like the opioid epidemic and the tragic spate of gun shootings over the past few years. But I am inspired by the leadership of our youth, high school students, teaching us sense and sensibility. For me personally, as you've heard, these four years have been filled with professional excitement as a refugee program I began four years ago has taken off and we have now seen over 450 children. Seeing children overcome unfathomable challenges couldn't be more rewarding. But advocating for immigrant children and families is really has been an arduous task and getting harder. On a more serious note, I grew a beard, and sadly, it came in gray. <laughs> but unlike Dr. Lurkey, I will not be shaving it off midway through this presentation. <laughs> I believe that's an inside joke. <laughs> Four years have passed, and now you are the first medical school graduates of Stryker. The founders could not be more proud. Let's have applause for these young, incredible professionals. I also want to acknowledge your dean, your professors, your advisors and mentors, whose love of teaching and dedication to your success cannot be overstated or overvalued. And I want to give special mention to the medical school administration. In my experience, administrators are the unsung heroes of successful programs. While these pioneers have made the dream of a new medical school in Kalamazoo a reality, and, and you've been embraced by the Kalamazoo community, that is a tremendous accomplishment. Today, you are bearing the fruit of your labor. And lastly, a big round of applause for your family and friends, your loved ones that have helped you through thick and thin and probably helped you into your gowns today. A big round of applause. And as everyone else, I want to give a big shout out to the moms who are here and those who couldn't be. All that hard work and love has paid off. This must be one of your proudest days. And I have a favor. Definitely. definitely. And I have a favor to ask. Could someone post a picture of me on social media to prove to my 81-year-old mom that I was actually here on Mother's Day? <laughs> She's a high school teacher still. And, and, she, and she espouses the adage, if not on Instagram, it didn't happen. <laughs> Thank you for taking that picture. <laughs> so four years have passed. What a great time for recollection. Do you remember the first time you thought of becoming a doctor? How old were you? Were you just a kid? Were you in high school? Or did the bug hit you in college? Or for, maybe, maybe for some of you brave souls, maybe this is your, th your second or third career. Do you remember how hard the work was, how long it took to get to where you are today? Do you remember the studying, the volunteer jobs, the MCATs? Do you remember the passion you felt when you felt when this was all beginning. I want you to take that passion and bring it to you in this next phase of your training. 
the transformation you will undergo to become a physician. When I was preparing for this address, my first thought was my own graduation from medical school. I remember where it was, Lincoln Center in New York, and the restaurant we celebrated in, Chun-Li. But, but honestly, I didn't remember a word of the address, or for that matter, who gave it. That's terrible. Then I asked some colleagues about their own graduation, and ditto, no one remembered. Even my close friend, Julie, remembered that Atul Gawande, one of my heroes, gave the address, but she couldn't remember one word he said. I had a few not so, 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 so I, had, I had a few not so helpful suggestions, like, read your last speech, they won't remember. <laughs> or go out naked, they definitely won't forget you. <laughs> I, I have my clothes on underneath, don't worry. But then I heard some reasonable advice from a number of friends who said, they won't remember what you said, but they will remember how you made them feel. Which I translated into, okay, dummy, try to inspire them. Not easy. So here's my challenge today. To inspire you to practice humanism and medicine, there is no other way. To inspire you to practice primary care, we really need you. To inspire you to bear witness to the inequalities in healthcare and fight disparities wherever you see them. Reverend Martin Luther King said, of all forms of inequity, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane, and he was right. And finally, to inspire you to be an advocate for your patients, your community, even your nation. Last week, I was at the Pediatric Academic Society meeting in Toronto, and I heard a lot of interesting new research, but there were three things non-researchy non that I took away. The first was from the from the president of the American Academy of Pediatrics, Dr. Colleen Kraft. What she said, giving her keynote address on the current state of affairs, was, today, more than ever, children's health is, an on, is on a collision course with our political system. She was talking about gun violence, obesity, neonatal opioid syndrome, climate change, and an immigration policy that is tearing families apart. I heard Dr. Paul Wise, a brilliant professor of pediatrics and so much more from Stanford, lament, physicians are the recipients of a failed social order. He was talking about the effects of war on children and the tremendous toll on child refugees around the world, a problem I have been seeing firsthand. And finally, a conversation I had with, one, with, a, with a neonatologist one evening about how poverty and stress is associated and, and one of the leading causes of prematurity. As he put it, we should all feel guilty about the billions of dollars we spend on secondary and tertiary interventions compared to the meager amounts spent on primary prevention and ending poverty. These three statements all speak to humanism, primary care, bearing witness, and advocacy. My ask to you today, we all go into medicine for different reasons, with myriad interests. My ask to you today is not why you went into medicine, but what values you will be bringing into your practice. Do any of those statements I read ring true to you? Will you fight inequities? Will you be on the front lines? Will you use your power as a physician to change the system so that everyone can have access to quality, affordable health care? I'm hoping you will. I myself was drawn to the struggles of social injustice ever since I was young. After all, I'm a child of the 60s and 70s. I just finished an executive leadership course, and one of the assignments, really the most difficult one, was to write our leadership credo, why you do what you do. In order to do this, we were asked to create a personal narrative incorporating important personal experiences that have occurred through our lives. Well, without giving you all the gory details, it became clear to me that my own life experiences contributed to my identification with the marginalized, with underdogs. I then had the audacity to believe that I could go into medicine as a way of fighting injustice. Well, my experiences in medical school and residency opened my naive eyes to what I was up against. I completed my residency at Montefiore Hospital in the Bronx. This was the late 80s. My memory of that time, cinematically, is emphatically that of a black and white film. 
It's not that there weren't technicolor moments, there were. But that was such a dark time in urban history. New York, like major other cities, was plagued with a crime wave, a crack cocaine epidemic, and HIV cases were skyrocketing. I remember the wards were filled with children dying of AIDS, and not a damn thing we could do about it. The newborn nurseries were overflowing with social holds, infants that were not allowed to go home with their mothers because they, the babies, tested positive for cocaine or heroin. There was a lot of negativity around then, but it, I never saw their mothers as criminals, only as victims. Heroin is only one letter short of a female hero. And while calling these mothers heroines might be going too far, the violence and hatred they experienced certainly warranted some type of empathic acknowledgement, or at least a badge of courage. The scenario is playing out again today, as I'm sure you were seeing firsthand on the wards. Humanism in medicine requires empathy and respect, even if you don't like your patient's personal choices. But I also remember the camaraderie, camaraderie of my fellow residents and attendings. And most of all, the nurses that saved my ass more than once. The countless IVs they put in and so much more. And the, that amazing NICU nurse who would make non-alcoholic pina coladas so he wouldn't be so depressed on our weekend calls. And Vashti, the ward clerk, she's still there 30 years later, who I would argue with about who was going to adopt Omar. Omar was a boy in foster care with leukemia who never once, never once had a visitor. Omar was my first patient when I was an intern. And that crazy elective I did on the mobile medical unit, going to homeless shelters and working with street youth, that literally changed my trajectory forever. That homeless healthcare project gave, my first, gave me my first job after residency. I've been working with that organization ever since. And that elective still reverberates today as Terra Firma, the refugee program, would never have formed if I had not been working on that mobile medical unit. In just a few weeks, you will begin your own amazing journey. And years from now, you will have your own memories, your own Vashtis and your own Omars. Soak it all up, do crazy electives, you never know where you might end up. Four years ago, I spoke about humanism in medicine, and it's a theme I have today. I know that is cheating, but I thought I should remind you about what I talked about last time. It is even more important to keep these principles in mind as you go into your clinical training. Let me remind you of the seven tenets of humanism in medicine. One, integrity, honesty with yourself and your patients. Excellence, be the smartest doctor you can be. Compassion, like for the moms I just spoke about. Altruism, help out that struggling resident or medical student. Respect, understand the autonomy and values of others. Empathy, do you know how it feels to be a patient? When was the last time you were sick? Service, not only to your patients, but to the community they live in and you work in. I said it is not what you practice, but how you practice, regardless of what field you go into. General peds, plastic surgery, doesn't matter. I said that wearing the white coat carries enormous responsibility, but what it means to you is not what it means to the person at the other end of your stethoscope or scalpel. The white coat or scrubs that you will be wearing creates a power dynamic that will be even greater when that person you're caring for doesn't look like you or is poor, is less educated, or chronically ill. And this will be the case most of the time. The biases we bring in and that our patients bring into the relationship is one of the most important forces, implicit and explicit, that affects the success of our outcomes. When things are not going as we plan, we'll ask, what are we missing? What are we not factoring in? What, won our, why won't our patients listen to our advice? Humanism and medicine meanings, me, means understanding that bias and bridging the gap. It means not letting the white coat become a barrier, but a window to communication and understanding. We are given the opportunity to hear the most intimate details of people's lives and examine their bodies. Trust is critical. One important way to develop these relationships is to hone your listening skills, the key to good communication. Our colleagues in psychology call this active listening and define it as an attempt to demonstrate unconditional acceptance and unbiased reflection. Or said another way, active listening aims to minimize the effect coming from our biases and practice mindful patience. 
This means not thinking of the next thing we have to do or the next thing, the next thing to say or judging a patient when they're giving us their history. This has relevance in all our lives, right? But we all know active listening is harder today than ever. Everyone has a cell phone and we are tethered to our electronic health record. I know this all too well. One day I was in the room with a toddler and his mother. I was busy typing down the developmental history. The mother was texting and getting calls every few minutes. And the child had his own tablet and was listening to the wheels, go around, the wheels on the bus go round and round for the 500th time. It was truly madness. I now have a rule, no cell phones, and I try to do most of my typing after the patient leaves the room. This is not easy. I'm waiting for technology to evolve. But as residents, you will be the frontline listeners. That, in essence, is what the crux of your job is. Listening, listening, listening. You will be the first to interview patients in the emergency room, on the wards, and in your continu continuity care clinics. You will be the ones staying up all night, monitoring your patient's condition, and you will be conveying all this in your notes and in your, and in your verbal reports to your team. The next three years will be time to practice and sharpen this important skill. Be an active listener. But I also want to tell you, be an active observer. I want to make the argument for active observation. Be keenly aware of the trends around you, the trends in your practice, the trends in your community. As we become more reliant on lab tests and technology, we can sometimes miss the forest for the trees. A light bulb went on when I realized we no longer needed a failure to thrive clinic, but actually a clinic to combat childhood obesity. That's the difference between the 20 and 21st century. We have more data than ever before, and that data is revealing more clearly the health disparities in our country. We can no longer hide from this truth. If you're black, you're 21% more likely to die from heart disease than if you're white. Black infant mortality is twice as high as for white infants. And, and maternal mortality is worse now than it was 25 years ago. If you live in the Deep South, your life is an average three years shorter than if you live in other parts of the country. And if you live below the poverty line, you are 25% more likely than higher income Americans to develop hypertension. I can go on. We have been blaming lifestyle, bad choices, high-risk behavior on these disparities for a long time. But medicine is evolving. You may, even, you may even say undergoing a revolution. We are beginning to understand that the cause of these disparities is not what people do. It is far, more, it is far deeper and more insidious. Can it be structural institutional racism, sexism, and classism that is to blame? The answer is a resounding yes. One of the most important trends in healthcare over the past decade is a growing body of evidence of the harmful effects of stress on our health. We must be aware of how all these isms create an environment of toxic stress. When you start spending time on the floors in the ED in your clinics, you will notice that there's a number of patients who come back over and over again. The umpteenth asthma hospitalization for that child the blood glucose that you can't control, the mom who keeps bringing her daughter back to, back to clinic because she refuses to go to school. What's going on? There are two key concepts that I know Dr. Dixon has taught you and that you should constantly be thinking out about through your residency and beyond. You will be part of the revolution. Number one, adverse childhood experiences, and number two, social determinants of health. There is incontrovertible evidence that, advanced, that adverse childhood experiences, ACEs, such as abuse, exposure to domestic violence, living in foster care, growing up with a parent dependent on drugs or alcohol, leads to an unregulated stress response. In other words, always being in that fight or flight mode. What follows is a cascade of biological events that affects every aspect of our physiology, our immune system, our cardiovascular cardiovascular system, our endocrine system. We know, thanks to breakthrough research of Faletti and Anda, the original authors of the ACEs study, that there is a dose response. The more, the, more childhood adverse, the more childhood adversity you experience, the worse your health outcomes will be. An important component to all of this is the buffering effect of a loving caregiver. But what happens if that caregiver is too stressed out or depressed herself? She can no longer be that buffer for her child. 
The unmitigated, this unmitigated, unmitigated stress, especially when chronic, is called toxic stress. We now have a better understanding how toxic stress can lead to serious health consequences, such as obesity, hypertension, cancer, and depression. Could it be the effects of adverse child experiences to blame for the poor outcomes of that asthmatic or diabetic patient I just mentioned? You bet. The ACEs research was published in 1998, but 20 years later, ACEs screening is not part of routine care. I highly recommend reading Dr. Nadine Burke Harris's book, The Deepest Well, where she per persuasively lays out the argument for ACEs screening. She, was doing, she is doing groundbreaking work translating the science of stress into primary care and helping us understand the physiologic, genetic, and epigenetic causes of health disparities. Not only do we need to think about past childhood experiences, but we also need to think of the impact on our health of natural and built environments and the social context in which our patients live, social determinants of health. Said another way, your life expectancy should not be determined, should not be determined by your zip code, but it does. Do a test, overlie the map of socioeconomic status with any chronic disease in your, neighbor, in your community. The areas with the highest prevalence of poverty will match exactly with the highest prevalence of disease. Does your patient have a safe, affordable housing, or do they live in a shelter? Are there farmers markets and CSAs in the community, or do they live in food deserts? Is the community safe and filled with green spaces, or are the parks too dangerous to allow children to play in? Your very own Michigan pediatrician, Dr. Mona Hanna Atisha, whose keen powers of observation discovered how the children of Flint, Michigan, especially in the poorest wards, were being poisoned by lead in the city's water supply. She realized that the rising number of children screening positive for lead poisoning in her clinic was directly tied to the city switching its water source from Lake Huron to, to the Flint River. Government officials were valuing financial austerity over the health of their children. She was told by those very same officials that her science was unfortunate. Well, it turned out it was unfortunate for them. She stood firm and eventually prevailed. The rest is history. Your role will be to champion innovative interventions that are, that are proving to make a difference, like group primary care, where their appointments are 90 minutes, not 20, where real teaching and role modeling can happen, like setting up a medical legal partnership so you can refer your patients to a lawyer who can help them with housing or benefits or other legal issues that affect their lives, or referring your young women to nurse family partnership to give them intensive support through their pregnancy and beyond, or making sure that behavioral health is embedded in every single place you work. Let me finish by telling you about Terra Firma and a little, how a little digging led to a successful medical legal partnership caring for refugee children. In the spring of, in the spring of 2013, after 23 years of working on a mobile medical unit at a drop-in center for homeless street youth, one of the case managers brought me an adolescent from Guatemala with severe mental illness. He couldn't tell us where he was getting care or what medications he was taking. He could barely talk. All he had was the business card from his pro bono attorney working at Catholic Charities. Well, we called that, we called that lawyer and learned that what we needed to know to treat that kid. But we also learned that he had this designation, unaccompanied immigrant child, which afforded him a legal path to residency. Law the lawyers then told us what they were seeing was a growing number of these refugee children who arrived in the US from Central America without a parent or legal guardian and had, and, and had great medical and mental health needs. They were looking for a clinic to send these children. And after hours of strategic meetings and way too much pizza, Terra Firma was born. We developed a program where a team of pro bono immigration lawyers and case managers come to our health center and work side by side with pediatricians and mental health professionals. Children from all over the city are referred to us to receive trauma-informed interventions. Their stories of violence, abuse, and abject poverty would make your hair stand on end and wonder, and whether, and wonder whether humanity exists at all. But it is their resilience, their ability to bounce back from adversity and thrive that makes this work so rewarding. We see children begin to put their lives back together through soccer and photography and support groups that we offer. 
We also write professional affidavits and corroborate their stories of trauma and testify in court. I'm happy to report that no child we have provided evidence for has lost a case. This is the power of multi-sector collaboration, breaking down the silos. I often ponder what would happen if we didn't have time to call that lawyer. We could have just sent that patient to the emergency room and not thought, and not thought any further about it. What would happen if we didn't entertain the idea of bringing immigration lawyers into our health center? We now have the biggest program for refugee children in the country. So you are entering your residency and the world will begin to open up to you. What an incredible, exciting time. Hopefully you will have been inspired by these stories and understand what your future can look like. You can push new ideas, you can think out of the box, and you should. But always keep in mind the role we physicians have to end health inequities and fight for social justice, no matter, where you, no matter where you practice or what field you go into. Oftentimes we feel powerless to change what we see. I like to reverse that and say that it might be that we just don't recognize the power that we have. Your MD confers enormous power and can be used to change the world. Let me end with a poem, with part of a poem from one of my favorite doctors, Theodore Geisel, also known as Dr. Seuss. You have brains in your head, you have feet in your shoes. You can steer yourself any direction you choose. You're on your own, and you know what you know. And you are the ones who will decide where to go. You're off to great places, today is your day. Your, mo your mountain is waiting, so go on your way. I wish you all the best of luck. I wish I could all see you in three years and see you onto the next phase of your journey. And lastly, take good care of yourselves. There is nothing more precious than your own health and well-being. Thank you so much for inviting me here today. Congratulations. Thank you, Dr. Shapiro. Now is the time for the hooding and conferring of degrees. Hooding ceremonies are carried out by institutions of higher education to recognize students who have earned an advanced degree beyond the bachelor's degree. At WMED for the Doctor of Medicine degree, the hood is hunter green with a chevron of brown and gold. During the hooding ceremony, each graduate will be called to the stage to have their hood placed over their head by their Learning Community Scholar Advisor and a guest hooder. Graduates had the opportunity to be hooded by a physician family member, friend, or mentor. During the hooding ceremony, we will announce the names of each guest hooder. We want to, we want to thank the guest hooders for joining us today for this special occasion as our graduates join the medical profession. As we begin, I ask that you hold your applause until all graduates have been hooded and the conferring of degrees is complete. Cameras and recording devices are permitted from your seat in the auditorium. Professional photographers are taking photos of the hooding and the distribution of diplomas. These photos, as well as official individual graduate headshots and a full class photo will be available for download on the WMED Flickr page. Dean Jensen, the Medical School Board of Directors, deans, department chairs, faculty and guests, I am honored to present to you for hooding the Western Michigan University Homer Stryker MD School of Medicine Class of 2018. From the Learning Community APGAR is Scholar Advisor Dr. Kathy Sharon. Guest hooder, Dr. Rajiv Rangrass. <laughs> Dr. Ana Villalobos Acosta. Guest hooder, Dr. John Aguilar. <laughs> Dr. 
Dr. Michael Behoon. Guest hooder, Dr. Melissa Olkin. <laughs> Dr. Peter White. Guest hooder, Dr. Melissa Olkin. Dr. Tu Win. Guest hooder, Dr. Christine Gibson. Dr. Rohan Kedar. Guest hooder, Dr. Christine Gibson. Dr. Eleanor Yu. Guest hooder, Dr. Carrie Sanborn. <laughs> Dr. William Rasmussen. Guest hooder, Dr. Carrie Sanborn. Dr. Andrew Sellis. Guest hooder, Dr. Carrie Sanborn. Dr. Cody Overmeyer. From the learning community, APGAR, is scholar advisor, Dr. Carrie Sanborn. Guest hooder, Dr. Donald Gradanis. Dr. Kevin Cates. Guest hooder, Dr. Maritza Lagos.
Dr. Serena Chen. Guest hooder, Dr. James Vidraki. Dr. Diana Fidraki. Guest Hooder, Dr. Lisa Miller. Dr. Amy Chung Hasawa. Guest Hooder, Dr. Mehran Rohani. Dr. Arad Abadi. From Learning Community Blackwell is Dr. Mark Lurkey. <coughs> Guest Hooder, Dr. Mehran Rohani. Dr. Taranom Shogi. Now, from Learning Community Blackwell, sorry. From Learning Community Blackwell is Scholar Advisor Dr. Diane Pierce. Guest Hooder, Dr. Lisa Miller. Dr. Mackenzie Akers. <laughs> Guest Hooder, Dr. Carrie Sanborn. Dr. John Livingstone. <laughs> Guest Hooder, Dr. Carrie Sanborn. Dr. Suthya 
de la Valle. Guest Hooder, Dr. Reem Jarbo. <coughs> Dr. Cynthia Bishara. Guest Hooder, Dr. Jerry Chow. Dr. Jennifer Chow. Guest Hooder, Dr. Mary Ann Skiba. Dr. Grant Finlayson. Guest Hooder, Dr. Priscilla Woodhams. Dr. Nina Sadiq. Guest Hooder, Dr. Joseph Prallo. Dr. Dr. Timothy Wysosen. Guest Hooder, Dr. Emmanuel Zervos. <laughs> Dr. Gustin Zervodakis. From the Learning Community Cushing, Scholar Advisor, Dr. Robert Rebar. Guest Hooder, Dr. Richard Roach. Dr. Nicole Baker.
Guest tutor, Dr. Joel Rhino. Dr. Andrew Chen. Guest hooder, Dr. Michael Redinger. <laughs> Dr. Olivia Fournier. Guest tutor, Dr. Karen Bovid. Dr. Tyler Harris. Guest hitter, Dr. Khalid Sanbol. Dr. Mona Sanbol. Guest hooder, Dr. Guat C. Dr. Daphne C. Guest hooder, Dr. Aaron Lane Davies. Dr. Lance Van Brocht. Guest hooder, Dr. Anna Hoekstra. Dr. Samuel Yost. Guest hooder, Dr. Mark Lurkey. Dr. Nicole Foley.
Guest Hooder, Dr. Brandy Shattuck. Dr. Alan Hifko. Guest Hooder, Dr. Brandy Shattuck. <laughs> Dr. Jacob Brueger. Guest Hooder, Dr. Brandy Shattuck. Dr. Brian Chung. Guest Hooder, Dr. Brandy Shattuck. Dr. Joshua Shinkowski. From the learning team. From the learning community, Drew, scholar advisor, Dr. Brandy Shattuck. Guest hooder, Dr. Angela Caffrey. Dr. Patricia Choi. Guest Hooder, Dr. Dominic Ochinski. Dr. Dr. Sheila Sullivan. Guest Hooder, Dr. Mark Schauer. Dr. Timothy Truong. Guest Hooder, Dr. Mark Lurkey. Dr. Garland Yu.
Guest Hooter, Dr. Ross Driscoll. Dr. Jeffrey Johnson. From the Learning Community Drew, Scholar Advisor, Dr. Ross Driscoll. Guest Hooter, Dr. Joyce DeYoung. Dr. Heather Chen. Guest Hooter, Dr. Yasis Rodrigo. Dr. Jacqueline Dowd. Guest Hooter, Dr. David Overton. <laughs> Dr. Diti Ranvilla. Guest Hooter, Dr. Randall Dyke. Dr. Nicholas Bean. Guest Hooter, Dr. Kevin Cavanaugh. Dr. Eric Edward. Guest Hooter, Dr. Joanne Baker. Dr. Michelle Walker. Thank you to our scholar advisors, guest hooders, and Dean Jensen. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Bonnie Dickinson, Associate Professor in the Department of Biomedical Sciences and the Chairperson of the Faculty Academic Council.
thank you, Dr. Zimkowski. I ask that the candidates for the Doctor of Medicine degree please stand. Dean Jensen, the faculty of the Western Michigan University Homer Stryker MD School of Medicine certifies that these candidates have dutifully completed the requirements of the degree Doctor of Medicine. As the candidates remain standing, on behalf of the Western Michigan University Homer Stryker MD School of Medicine Board of Directors, I confer onto each of you the degree Doctor of Medicine. Congratulations. <laughs> now is the time to move your tassel to the left side of your cap as the symbol of your graduate status. Congratulations, graduates, or should I say, congratulations, doctors. Dear guests, the oath of Hippocrates is a symbol of the medical profession and perhaps the most widely known of Greek medical texts. The Hippocratic Oath requires a new physician to swear upon the healing gods that he or she will uphold professional ethical standards. Over the centuries, it has been rewritten often to suit the values of different cultures that have been influenced by Greek medicine. A medical oath declares the ethos of medicine and includes solemn promises that identify the covenant relationship between physicians, other healthcare providers, patients, and society as a whole. During the very first weeks of medical school, students in the class of 2018 created their own class oath, which enabled the students to reflect on the principles they feel are important to embrace as medical professionals. By writing their own words, the oath created the foundation for their medical education and medical career. I welcome the president of the class of 2018, Sam Yost, who will lead the graduates as they recite the class oath. Sam earned his undergraduate degree from Saginaw Valley State University and a master's in public health from the University of Michigan. Sam will complete his residency training in obstetrics and gynecology at the University of Michigan Health in Ann Arbor. He is a recipient of the Outstanding Student Award for the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology. He's a member of the Alpha Omega Alpha Honor Medical Society and the Upjohn Humanism Honor Society. Sam received the Peter H. Capelli Endowed Scholarship and the James R. Ryan Family Foundation Endowed Scholarship. Dr. Yost. Thank you, Dr. Zimkowski. Uh, as our class is already standing, I would like to invite any physicians or medical professionals in the audience who would like to join us in our oath. Uh, it's on page six of your uh, handout. We, the students of the inaugural class of Western Michigan University, Homer Stryker MD School of Medicine, swear the following oath. We pledge to holistically serve our patients and their families, devoting ourselves to their welfare. We pledge to approach all patients without bias, honoring their autonomy and demonstrating respect compassion, and cultural sensitivity. We pledge to enrich the medical profession, perpetually seeking knowledge and self-improvement while accepting our personal and professional limitations. We pledge to nurture a love of learning in future physicians, guiding them as our mentors guide us. We pledge to embrace collaboration, respecting the wisdom and skills of our fellow professionals. We pledge to avoid the snares of arrogance, callousness, and greed. We pledge to embrace humility, fidelity, and altruism. We take this vow solemnly and freely in the presence of our colleagues, families, and communities for as long as we bear the honor and the responsibility of serving in the medical profession.
Thank you, everyone. This concludes our commencement proceedings. Following the recessional of our graduates, the faculty, and the platform party, you're invited to join us for a reception in the second floor lobby. The graduates will be gathered here in the auditorium for the official class photo, and then they will meet with family and friends at the reception. The recessional will start with the graduates, followed by the faculty, then the hooders, and finally the platform party. Please stand for the recessional. Thank you for joining us today, and congratulations to the inaugural class, WMED Class of 2018.